to the latest rapid response webinar from the section of civil rights and social justice, co-sponsored by the section of administrative law and the judicial division. My name is Angela Scott, and I'm a member of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Council. During the 2008-2019 bar year, our goal is to rapidly respond to government action that may impact civil rights and civil liberties by offering free webinars, pop.org slash CRSJ, our Facebook page and our Twitter handle at ABA underscore CRSJ for more news and information and replays of our guest programming. If you like our work, we invite you to become a member of the section and collaborate with us on projects you wanna develop and offer to our members and to the general public. We are thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Judicial Independence and Administrative Law Judges. Is this the end of an era? This program will provide a history of the Administrative Procedure Act and the role of administrative law judges within the act prior to Lucia, as well as a discussion of Lucia and the resulting executive order and the Department of Justice guidance and the role of administrative law judges within the APA after Lucia. Our moderator today is Chief Judge James Gilbert from the US Postal Service. He currently serves as Chief Administrative Judge for the United States Postal Service in Washington, DC. In that capacity, Judge Gilbert's jurisdiction includes all of the United States. Judge Gilbert adjudicates matters involving fraud in the use of US mail, private mail disputes, program fraud, and numerous other matters under the Administrative Procedure Act. In his capacity as a federal administrative law judge, Judge Gilbert has also presided over cases involving se several federal agencies, including the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Department of Fe Veteran Affairs, Federal Mine Safety Health and Review Commission, Internal Revenue Service, Department of Education, and the Department of Treasury. Our other distinguished panelists include Judge Aaron M. Wirth, an administrative law judge for the Federal Maritime Commission, and Assistant Professor Jennifer Mascott from George Mason University. During today's program, if you are so inclined, you can ask questions of our panelists by finding the questions box on the right-hand side panel and typing in your questions. There, please note that there is also a handout. There will be a time at the end for our panelists to address your questions on the presentation or the handout. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Please feel free to leave us feedback or ask questions to follow up. And with that, I will turn the program over to Judge James Gilbert. Judge Gilbert. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to our friends on the East Coast and good morning to our colleagues on the West Coast. And Welcome to the section of Civil Rights and Social Justice webinar today entitled Judicial Independence and Administrative Law Judges. Is this the end of an era? And as an administrative law judge, I hope the answer to that question is no, but I guess we'll find out today. Uh, before we begin, I have a brief disclaimer. Uh, and the opinion I express here today is solely my own and does not reflect the opinions or policy of the United States Postal Service or the federal government. What prompted today's webinar was the decision in the United States Supreme Court uh, in Lucia versus SEC. And that was a case that was issued on June 21st of this year. Uh, the Lucia decision was an important case in administrative law, and it was also a very important case uh, for the Appointments Clause of the United States Constitution. And how those two intersect is part of what we'll be discussing today. Um, we're very fortunate to have joining us today two distinguished panelists to discuss some of the basic issues raised in Lucia and discuss some of the broader impacts of the decision uh, in both administrative law, but more importantly in the cases that administrative law judges preside over, which virtually uh, touch all Americans in ways small and large. Uh, let's get to some intro here. Uh, our first panelist is Professor Jennifer Mascott, who is an assistant professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School. Professor Mascott teaches administrative law in federal courts and writes in the areas of administrative and constitutional law and the separation of powers. Her scholarship has been cited by the Supreme Court, including in the Lucia case, and she's been published or is forthcoming in the Stanford Law Review, the George Mason Law Review, the Cato Supreme Court Law Review, the BYU Law Review, 
the George Washington Law Review, and the Loyola Journal of Regulatory Compliance. The well-known Legal Theory blog has reviewed her work as pathbreaking, and she is a permanent commentator at the Yale Journal of Regulations Notice and Comment blog. Uh, in uh, this past summer, Professor Mascot was appointed Vice Chair of the Judicial Review and Supreme Court Committee within the ABA's Section of Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. Uh, she is a former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and law clerk to Judge Brett M. Kavanaugh of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Kavanaugh, where have I heard that name before? I have to think about that. Uh, Professor Mascot graduated summa cum laude from the George Washington University Law School, where she received the John Bell Lawner Award for the highest cumulative GPA in the graduating class. Also joining us today is the Honorable Aaron Masson Worth. Judge Worth currently serves as United States Administrative Law Judge with the Federal Maritime Commission, where she's been since 2010. Previously, she was the first female administrative law judge appointed to the Richmond, Virginia Hearing Office of the Social Security Administration. Prior to her appointment as an ALJ, Judge Worth litigated a wide variety of cases throughout the United States, including as a legal aid managing attorney, a Federal Trade Commission attorney advisor, a private practice attorney, and a criminal prosecutor. Judge Worth wrote, uh, rather, Judge Worth taught business law and frequently speaks about legal issues, and her numerous publications include articles for Law Review, ABA Publications, and the West Group uh, ALR series. Uh, Judge Worth's work on behalf of military families, and I encourage you to Google Judge Worth because that work was uh, pretty outstanding, uh, has been recognized by the White House, including First Lady Michelle Obama. Uh, ABA has recognized her work, the Department of Defense, and the Military Officers Association of America. Judge Worth is an executive committee member and past president of the Federal Administrative Law Judges Conference. She earned a BA from Smith College and a Juris Doctor from the William & Mary Law School, where she was the senior articles editor of the William & Mary Law Review. I want to thank you both for being here today, and I'm going to start with you, Judge Worth. Uh, many of our viewers uh, today don't practice necessarily in administrative law as we do every day, and so perhaps a little background might help set the stage for a discussion on the CHIA. Um, would you mind talking to us briefly about the Administrative Procedure Act, uh, the process of becoming an ALJ, uh, at least as it existed for the past 70 years before the events of this summer? Thanks, Judge Worth. Thank you, Judge Gilbert, um, and the opinions today are my own. I am not representing my agency or the federal government. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with everyone. Um, my goal really is to provide some background about the role and hiring of administrative law judges uh, as it existed before this summer. So I'll start with who we are and what we do. Um, there are just under 2,000 administrative law judges or ALJs. We serve in about 30 federal agencies and handle a wide variety of cases. So sort of broadly speaking, there are three categories. There are entitlement cases. Uh, those are benefits for Social Security disability, longshore and harbor workers compensation, those types of cases. And that's actually the largest category of cases. Um, there are also enforcement cases. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, Federal Mine Safety, uh, Animal Welfare by the USDA, a wide variety of agencies uh, involved in enforcement, um, and some regulatory cases, for example, those before the Federal Energy Regu Regulatory Commission. So to kind of put it in a, in a big picture, ALJs really are the trial judges or the fact finders for federal agencies. So whether someone's disability claim has been denied by Social Security or a small business wants to defend itself against an enforcement action, often the first live actual person who they meet who is making a decision is the administrative law judge. ALJs basically have two functions. We preside over hearings, taking testimony, evidence, uh, supervising discovery if that's allowed, and then we make initial determinations about resolving the dispute. So we make that initial decision, uh, the agency then can review it, and the agency's decision is sort of more of an appellate or policy um, type of role. So 
So a, a little example of how cases um, proceed at different types of agencies. A Social Security claimant um, files a claim for disability benefits. That is reviewed by a state examiner who looks at the paperwork that's been filed. After the decision, there's an option for reconsideration and a second hearing, again, um, by paper. So the third step of the Social Security process is a hearing in front of an administrative law judge. This is the only opportunity to be heard in person, which can be particularly important when credibility determinations are being made. Reviews of ALJ decisions go to the Social Security Appeals Council. Those are administrative judges or AJs. Uh, and then the, the, if the case continues, it can be appealed to the federal district court uh, at that fifth stage. So kind of a long process. Uh, in terms of regulatory claims, that tends to be handled a little bit differently. Uh, normally, there's an enforcement division that conducts some sort of investigation. The agency or the commission typically votes to initiate a complaint, starting the case, and referring it to the Office of Administrative Law Judges. An ALJ then supervises discovery if allowed, holds hearings, and issues the written decision. The case then goes back to the commission on appeal, or the commission can choose um, to review the decision, and they issue the final agency decision. From there, those cases are typically appealed to federal appellate court. So ALJs are sometimes confused with either state ALJs or administrative judges. Um, administ well, really both state ALJs and administrative judges perform similar tasks. Um, however, only ALJs function with the protection of the APA or the Administrative Procedures Act. So um, AJs, for example, would include immigration judges um, and, and other types of judges that, that don't go through this process that I'm going to explain to you. So a little bit about the history of ALJs. Uh, ALJs were originally called examiners or hearing examiners. Um, examiners were reported as early as 1906 in the Interstate Commerce Act, which authorized the appointment of examiners to receive evidence. In 1914, the Federal Trade Commission was established with the power to appoint examiners. The Shipping Act of 1916 and other agency authorizations followed. Over time, concern developed about combining the powers of investigation, prosecution, and adjudication in the same agency and sometimes in the same person or the same office, and whether decision-making was fair under those circumstances. The Supreme Court in Ramsbeck later explained many complaints were voiced against the actions of hearing examiners, it being charged that they were mere tools of the agency, concerned and subservient to the agency heads in making their proposed findings of fact and recommendations. An Attorney General's Commission to Study Administrative Procedure was appointed by Roosevelt in 1939, and a report was issued in 1941. The report recommended that hearing examiners be partially independent from the agency. The balance was essentially allowing the agency some control over the policy and the final decision, but ensuring that the factual basis was independently determined. So we come to the Administrative Procedure Act, which was adopted by Congress in 1946 to improve the administration of justice by prescribing fair administrative procedures. Now regarding adjudication or litigation, uh, the APA requires notice, the opportunity to be heard by an independent adjudicator. So there's a separation of functions, that the adjudication or the decision making should be separate from the investigation. The control of compensation, promotion, and tenure was then also vested in the Civil Service Com Commission to protect this independence. The Civil Service Commission functions were later separated so that the Office of Personnel Management took over the hiring functions 
and the Merit Systems Protection Board is responsible for tenure and removal. So let's move on to focus on OPM, which is responsible for the hiring functions. Uh, and, and we're going to sort of move forward, uh, and I'll talk about um, how that hiring process operated um, before the executive order, which will be described later. So uh, the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, um, has a process to um, develop the examination. Um, that it gives to people who would like to become administrative law judges. They go through uh, an occupational analysis, um, which as I understand it, uh, includes observations and meetings with ALJs throughout the country, um, different cities, different agencies, uh, meetings with chief ALJs in each agency, um, a task competency linkage, where they're trying to identify the competencies necessary to perform the tasks of an administrative law judge. And to finalize this process, they do an online occupational analysis survey, which is sent to all ALJs, um, having them link critical tasks to critical competencies. So the OPM um, developed this list of uh, competencies that it feels that administrative law judges must have. Um, before it develops the examination used to hire them. So um, the last time they went through this whole process, the 13 competencies that were identified as required for administrative law judges were decision making, interpersonal skills, judicial analysis, judicial decisiveness, judicial management, judicial temperament, litigation and courtroom competence, oral communication, problem solving, professionalism, reasoning, self-management, and writing. At the time of the executive order this summer, OPM was actually in the process of redoing this occupational analysis. I think it had been six or seven years since the last one. Um, and many of us had spent the week before the executive order going through and doing some very tedious analysis of our day-to-day -day tasks for them. So after they come up with these competencies, OPM develops an examination, um, which they use to test those competencies. Um, and they include ALJs, retired ALJs, as subject matter experts in terms of developing many of the sections of the examination. Um, and if we could take a few more minutes, I'd like to go uh, into a little more detail about how that application and examination process worked. So I'm a military spouse, uh, which means I've moved often and been hired for a lot of different positions. This hiring process was the most unique and thorough process that I've ever seen. So it's a simple seven-step process, starting with an initial application requiring demonstration of minimum requirements. So the minimum requirements were an active or good standing law license and seven years of qualifying experience. So qualifying experience with litigation or administrative um, handling contested hearings where there is a formal process. So it did not, not include qualifying experience, did not include handling uncontested cases, um, did not include clerks of court did not even include esteemed law professors as part of the qualifying experience. People who passed those minimum requirements moved on to an online component, um, which consisted of a situational judgment test. This was a timed text and video based scenario, a writing sample that was timed where candidates gave written responses to predetermined questions and an experience assessment where the applicant would demonstrate relevant experience to the ALJ position, and that was not timed. Once that had been uh, completed, and if an applicant passed that step, they were invited uh, to an in-person component uh, where we had the pleasure of sitting for a written demonstration, uh, which is a four-hour examination requiring preparation of a clear, concise, and well-reasoned legal decision. 
Then there was a logic-based measurement test, which was a two-hour multiple-choice logic test. And finally, a structured interview where a panel evaluated the applicant's responses to competency-based questions related to being an ALJ. And that usually took around an hour uh, and was in front of a panel consisting of three people, uh, an ALJ, an OPM employee, and an attorney or a second ALJ. So at the time of the executive order, hundreds of applicants had paid on their own dime uh, to fly to DC for the pleasure of taking this two-day uh, examination and they were waiting their results. Now, once you went through that examination process that did not ensure you a job, um, the people that passed that process were put on a register of eligible candidates. So when an agency had an opening, they would contact OPM and they would be given the top three candidates by score for the location of the opening. The agency could select from this OPM register or agencies could hire a sitting ALJ, essentially poaching an ALJ from another agency. So this leads to our next topic, which was how the agencies actually selected and appointed um, those ALJs. Uh, there were a variety of ways. Sometimes the head of the agency did it. Sometimes that was delegated to another employee, and sometimes that was delegated to the Office of Administrative Law Judges. And that brings us to the issues raised in Lucia. So I will hand it over at this point, unless there are any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Worth, for that summary and uh, that discussion of the appointment process. Uh, there's a method to our madness. There's a reason why we went into detail about that uh, appointment process because uh, much of what we're going to talk about today has to do with the appointment process for administrative law judges. Uh, that's what the Lucia case was all about. So we're going to uh, turn now to uh, Professor Mascot uh, and hear from her on uh, a little bit more now as we turn our attention away from the background and to more recent events, uh, including the Lucia case. Uh, Professor Mascot, if you, could, uh, if you could take over for me. Thank you, Judge Gilbert, and thank you, Judge Worth. That was really terrific. I really, um, it was so, it was really helpful going back to 1906 and hearing about the history of the, uh, the program and the clarification about the name change, and then now what ALJs have come to mean in the system and the separation of functions. And um, you know, thinking through, um, we've been talking about formal adjudication some in the in the class of students that I teach, and that background and the way that you summarized it was really. Um, was really great and touches on a lot of the things that we've been talking about and does, um, as Judge Gilbert pointed out, perfectly lead us into the Lucia case. And so Lucia, the, the, the full name of the case when it got to the Supreme Court was Lucia versus Securities and Exchange Commission. And it's a case that involved the selection process that the Securities and Exchange Commission had been using to hire its administrative law judges. And as Judge Worth um, talked about, administrative law judges preside over formal adjudication or formal hearings within agencies. Um, and as she pointed out a, a bit, formal adjudication within agencies in a lot of ways looks like we might think of a federal trial in the sense that parties can present evidence, they can present witnesses at times, sometimes there's cross-examination. And as Judge Worth pointed out, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission administrative law judges, and I'll, I'll start calling them ALJs just for simplicity, um, they often reach the initial decision in adjudicative matters um, for the SEC. So in this particular litigation, in this particular case, an SEC ALJ had imposed a civil penalty on Mr. Lucia and had given him a lifetime bar from participating in the securities industry he'd been practicing in. And it, the, the case was all started because of, of um, the agency feeling as though Mr. Lucia had provided misleading predictions to people who were investing their retirement funds. So, of course, there would have been an investigation and then a charge brought, and then the ALJ reached a decision in the case. And so, in the course of trying to challenge the imposition of those penalties and those consequences, one of the claims that Mr. Lucia raised within the agency itself is that the ALJ had been improperly appointed. And so, 
different from federal trials, like if we were in federal trials, of course, in Article Three courts, typical federal courts, the process there is for the, the president to appoint the judge with the, with the consent of the Senate. And at least within the SEC, the ALJs have been hired by SEC staff, you know, because we think of... Um, Adjudication within agencies as a as a somewhat different different thing, looking at different cases. In fact, often, as Judge Worth pointed out, those cases ultimately make their way into being appealed into federal courts. But in this particular case, um, the, the ALJ in Mr. Lucia's case had been hired by SEC staff, particularly the chief ALJ. Um, and so the question in the case became, um, is there some kind of restraint in the U.S. Constitution that limits how agencies can pick administrative law judges. And so the particular claim was that the appointments clause, which is in Article II of the Constitution, covered administrative law judges and was not followed here. And so what the Article II appointments clause says basically is that any federal official who qualifies as an officer of the United States, and that's a particular phrase used, that such an individual has to be appointed in one of just four ways, either by the president with Senate consent, the president alone, an apartment head, which in this particular case would have been the SEC commissioners or a court of law. And so the key legal question in this particular litigation was simply whether the SEC's ALJs qualify as officers of the United States. If they're not officers, if they are in a different category, they're just government employees, then there wouldn't be any constitutional constraints on their selection at all under the appointments clause. But if they are officers of the United States, the problem would have been that the SEC commissioners had not actually signed off on the final selection of Mr. Lucia uh, and given him, or I'm sorry, on the judge in Mr. Lucia's case and given um, the ALJ the final appointment. So just to give a tiny bit of background, one thing that made this case a little bit more complicated and I think led to the case coming to the forefront is because, you know, the Supreme Court, unlike with other constitutional provisions that it sometimes interprets like due process or the Commerce Clause, really over time has not had comparatively many cases interpreting who's an officer of the United States in the Appointments Clause. There was a bit, there had, there were some cases historically back in the 19th century about how you need to be an ongoing official rather than a contractor type of person to be an officer. More recently, it wasn't until 1976 uh, in the case called Buckley versus Vallejo, dealing with campaign finance issues, where the court actually gave language saying officers of the United States have to exercise significant authority. And um, particularly, they were looking at FEC commissioners in that case and found them to be officers. Then it was 15 years until the court ruled on the proper interpretation again of what makes somebody an officer who has to come under the appointments clause. And there was a case called Freitag versus Commissioner in 1991 where the court looked at a position called a special trial judge within the tax court. And so the Supreme Court had several paragraphs in that opinion that suggested that because special trial judges positions were established by law, their duties were specified in the statute, um, they had discretion, they dealt with significant issues, that they were officers of the United States. So the lower courts then, um, the appeals courts below the Supreme Court, um, over the next few years attempted to try to apply that decision, trying to figure out what does significant authority mean in conjunction with these factors that were at issue in the Freitag case. And so the D.C. Circuit, which is the federal appeals court in D.C., often is the court that first uh, receives appeals from administrative agencies because a lot of agencies have headquarters in Washington, D.C., and congressional statutes will enable individuals to uh, appeal agency decisions to the D.C. Circuit. So what it says in issues like of administrative law tends to be um, seen as central sometimes to how administrative agencies operate. So there was a case brought with administrative law judges in the FDIC in a case called Landry in 2000, where the DC circuit had to figure out how to bring together this general significant authority standard with this fry tag decision for special trial judges. And what the DC circuit did is try to look at those few paragraphs in the fry tag decision and, and look at all the factors being talked about and apply them to the administrative law judges and said, we see a difference. And the difference that the DC circuit saw was, was um, this issue of whether ALJs can reach final decisions for the agency. Because the Freitag opinion had said, even if the special trial judges aren't, already, aren't doing all these other important things, nonetheless, do we know for sure they're officers because they reach final decisions in some cases for the tax court. And at least the ALJs at issue in, um, 
in the Landry case in 2000 really didn't do anything final for the agency. There always had to be a higher level, the head of the agency itself signing off on decisions. That actually was also the case at the end of the day with the SEC's ALJs, where even though they were writing the initial decision, the commissioners themselves had to issue an order before anything that the ALJ did actually it had legal effect. And so the DC Circuit in that 2000 case, and then again in 2016 with Lucia said, these individuals are not, re uh, issuing final action for their agency, and so they are not officers. And so what happened, which is often the case with uh, cases coming to the Supreme Court, is that another appeals court in um, a different circuit in the Tenth Circuit reached the exact opposite finding about the SEC ALJs and interpreted the Freitag case differently and said, we don't think finality matters at all. And so within a few months time, you had one circuit court saying SEC ALJs are officers, the other one saying they're not. And so there was a lot of kind of complicated uh, po procedural changes in this case as it made its way to the Supreme Court, which caused it to get even more attention than it would have otherwise. Um, including the government changing its position about whether the ALJs was off, were officers, including um, the DC Circuit at one point reaching an evenly split decision on the question. And so finally, this made its way up to the Supreme Court. It was not argued until near the end of the term, the end of April. Um, but there was a lot of um, just sort of expectation about what is what is going to happen here. And, and one of the reasons that there was a lot of anticipation, I think ties into the title of this um, of this webinar and, and touches on some of the reasons underlying some of the selection procedures that Judge Worth had talked about initially. And so there were a lot of a lot of um, extra briefs filed by extra people in this case because at the end of the day, the case touches on the core question of what is our source of accountability or responsibility within the uh, administrative agencies and with administrative law judges? And so um, for the most part, and, and, and different folks on different sides had different, different thoughts. They didn't line up this way entirely, but, but for the most part, a lot of the defenders of the way in which um, the process had gone on, who didn't really want um, the heads of departments, didn't feel they needed to be involved, were pointing out, um, look, the adjudicative procedure, there's a lot of important issues. There are a lot of rights at stake. There are a lot of significant penalties. Um, people's circumstances are changing in our system. When um, judicial type decisions come down, we see independence as a very key priority. And what's the best way to maintain independence? It's it's always been thought that it's to have more of a scientific objection selection system in place that Judge Worth was talking about, where there's objective uh, criteria that are being used to evaluate the hiring of, of, of individuals who are going to oversee these important proceedings. And, and if we let the chief ALJ make the decisions, then we don't have to worry about the decision becoming too political as it goes up the chain, um, because the agency head is more likely to have been appointed directly by a president. And does it raise um, political questions if, if there's too much involvement there at the highest level with the selection of the administrative law judges? On the other side would have been a completely different idea of where um, just accountability comes from or the source of power in the executive branch based on some, some Supreme Court language and other cases over the years that have talked about uh, an idea of electoral accountability and the idea that because we're in the executive branch, um, the way that people would have influence or responsibility or be able to make sure that the, the, the that, that there's accountability and transparency in the selection of officials comes more from the idea of electoral accountability and we elect the head of the executive branch and we need to then be able to hold the head of the executive branch responsible for picking people who are well qualified and the way that we can hold the head of the executive branch responsible is making sure that the president or department head at the end of the day signs off on um, the selection of the administrative law judges. So these were some pretty complicated questions, really getting to the heart of what is the source of power within the executive system coming to the Supreme Court. And so that's why there was a lot of discussion and a lot of focus. And what's very interesting about the Supreme Court's decision in Lucia is that the Supreme Court really did not say a lot in its opinion at all to give us insight um, as to whether, I mean, it, 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 it didn't really actually wrestle in a really um, 
in-depth way with those ideas. What the court said instead, which is fairly typical in a lot of um, decisions at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said the precise question before us is whether administrative law judges in the SEC are officers of the United States and look at this, we have this Freitag precedent, these special trial judges and, and this was actually raised by Justice Kagan at, at oral argument. These justice, these special trial judges do nine out of ten of the same things as the ALJs, and so there's so much similarity here. Um, and, and some of the similarities were they take testimony, receive evidence, examine witnesses, take pre-hearing depositions. This is all in the opinion. Conduct trials, administer oaths, rule on motions, generally regulate the course of the hearing, have power to enforce compliance with discovery orders. And so the court went through this whole list and said these positions seem so similar that it just seems like this is a straight up clear application of fry tag. And Therefore, uh, the ALJs are officers of the United States. We know people want us to talk a little bit more about who an officer of the United States is in general or what does significant authority mean. Maybe one day we will have to tell you, but we don't have to tell you today because the ALJs are so similar to the special trial judges. Um, so that was sort of what the opinion said. And the opinion also seemed to um, really make sure that the Supreme Court was not going to be seen as predetermining the constitutionality of other positions in the sense that the court also said, and by the way, even though these positions have these nine out of 10 similarities, we're not even going to tell you that a person has to do all those things in the future to be an officer. So you don't, so you don't really know after the opinion. I mean, certainly if you have another adjudicator within agencies who does these nine out of 10 things, then they seem clearly to be officers under the decision. If they do seven out of the 10 things, are they good enough? Well, under the DC Circuit's old approach to interpreting Supreme Court case law, maybe not. But the Supreme Court said, no, we really don't want anybody to walk away thinking we're saying all nine qualifications are required. So, you know, those of us who are sort of sitting on the outside looking in and, and trying to interpret it and, and think about it and, and figure out um, what it means, you know, you don't you don't really know. You just sort of do your best to, to compare and contrast. And Judge Gilbert's made a couple of references to the administration's executive order, which also then steps in and, and, and attempts to help interpret this for the executive branch. And so I will get to that in, in just a minute. I want to just touch briefly on some of the separate opinions in the case. Um, so, so the case was the, the majority opinion was joined by six of the justices. It was written by Justice Kagan. Justice Breyer joined the judgment in the case, which means he found that this particular administrative law judge was unlawfully appointed, but not on the constitutional claim that I mentioned. He felt that um, it was not clear that the SEC had gone through the proper statutory procedures to appoint the ALJ. The reason I, and then Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor just thought that the ALJs were not constitutional officers at all and that um, they needed to just be taken totally out of this, um, this more political or electoral accountability realm. The reason I bring up Justice Breyer's separate opinion is because he went through in his opinion what was motivating his um, concern about finding that ALJs are officers, and it gets to a lot of the um, ideas that Judge Worth and Judge Gilbert have alluded to, the concern that um, if there's political appointment and then also if there is political, if there's if there's removal on, it, it, on the back end, if, if these individuals are executive officers, does that raise implications for how they can be selected, but then also how um, they can be removed if need be? Um, and the reason that he raised that question is because in 2010, the Supreme Court issued a decision called Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. It's another very complicated case, but at the end of the day, the court said in that case, if you have one official in the executive branch who has tenure protections where they can be fired only for good cause, and that individual appoints somebody else, both people cannot have for cause removal protections. And the reason is that because if they do, it's too hard at the end of the day for the president, if, if, if the administrative agency starts going in a direction that's different than the executive branch priorities, it's too difficult for the president to be able to supervise what's happening if there are two layers of tenure protections. Now that opinion had a footnote carving out agency adjudication and saying that's different from public company according, accounting oversight board members. We are not deciding today that administrative adjudicators would be subject to that same rule. But the rule for those individuals in that case was basically to say, just 
bottom line, you can't have these two layers of tenure protection at all. And Justice Breyer had written a dissent going through all the positions in the administrative branch or executive branch that might fall under that rule. So his concern was that even though the majority in that case had carved out agency adjudication as a separate area that may not be impacted by the free enterprise fund rule, Justice Breyer doesn't seem confident that that carve out is going to necessarily stand and so didn't even want to take the first step in the direction of finding that ALJs are officers of the United States. But if I'm reading his opinion, it was not as much because he was extensively concerned about the, about the selection process at the front end, but more concerned about the removal on the back end. And you know, the other interesting factor here, and, and I don't know if Judge Worth and Judge Gilbert maybe will have comments on this later, but the other interesting thing is that um, you know, there there has been a value of wanting to make sure, and of course, like adjudicators obviously must be making impartial decisions based on the law. We, we have to have a system in place that makes sure that that's happening. But then there's already this kind of connection where in most cases, administrative law judge decisions often, and Judge Worth and Judge Gilbert would be more experts on this, but my understanding from what I've read involved in the Lucia litigation is that often as a practical matter, those decisions might stand for the agency and they may just be signed off on by the head of the agency. But the head of the agency in a lot of cases, at least in the SEC also has authority to come in and change their, those decisions if they want to. So you've already got that sort of situation where at the end of the day, the final decisions made by the agency head. And so one concern is even if you have these impartial agency adjudicators, um, that same, um, that's that same uh, separation from the executive branch is already isn't happening with the with the final decision maker, the commissioner. So what is the thinking with having the commissioners be subject to political appointment and possible removal and having a different system for the ALJs? And is that necessary or is is that just already, um, you know, are, are the issues there already so complex because of the way in which the head of the agency reviews the decision? Nonetheless, again, the court did not get into the nitty gritty of those decisions. But what happened um, very soon after the decision came down, as Judge Gilbert mentioned, is that the president issued an executive order to implement Lucia. And in that executive order, the president basically clarified and said, you know, we're just moving forward, going to act as though all ALJs are subject to the Lucia decision. Um, and 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 so, in, and to preempt any potential constitutional problems moving forward, what we're going to do is we're going to ex exempt all of those ALJs from a lot of the competitive service procedures that Judge Worth described at the very beginning of the call. So Judge Worth described how the Office of Personnel Management had gone through this process of having all these criteria and would evaluate candidates and then they'd be ranked and you choose from the ranked candidates. And what the um, what the executive order said is it was going to take ALJ selection out of that process. So there's a couple interesting things about the executive order. One is that the other limited thing about the Lucia holding is that the, in, the Supreme Court actually just said that the ALJs had to be selected by the Securities and Exchange Commissioners. So that selection system would have actually been totally permissible even under this this the this the um old structure that judge worth talked about how it used to be um at least in some agencies is that ALJs would be selected by all those objective procedures that judge worth talked about and then the head of the agency might make the final sign off so the extra question that the executive order was bringing into the mix is we know now all ALJs have to get their final stamp of approval by the head of the agency is the road that we use to get there through the application of the Office of Personnel Management test a proper one, or does it too strongly constrain the selection process of the head of the department such that the head of the department is no longer um, in, engaging in the actual appointment? Um, and so it's an interesting question. And um, you know, in a longer in a longer article, um, I wrote just a little bit about some of the questions that honestly that that, that interestingly were raised actually back um, as far as 1871 in an attorney general opinion that was written right around the time that the original Civil Service Act, the Pendleton Act, was being enacted, where um, 
The question was, if you have somebody who's an officer of the United States, can they be subject to these competitive merit-based based procedures? So the argument for, as a constitutional matter that it would be okay is, um, at least to a degree, is that in the appointments clause, the department head or the president has to appoint the officer, but Congress gets to establish offices by law. So the only reason that there are ALJs, for example, in the first place is because Congress created the position. And so in the past, in um, authorizing Congress to create positions for many, many, many um, decades in our system, we have believed that that means that Congress, at least for um, lower level officers can impose some criteria on how they are selected. So for example, Congress could say, um, well, um, the agency can have administrative law judges, but only if they have been licensed attorneys for 10 years. And that could be a statutory requirement. Congress hasn't always gotten that specific, but the idea would be that, that Congress in establishing it by law could say that. So maybe it's also constitutional for Congress to say, you can hire ALJs, but only if they meet A, B, and C criteria. Well, what the 1871 opinion said is it said, we have concerns about it. It said, certainly it can't be the case that Congress can impose restrictions that are so constraining that the department heads restricted to picking only one person, like only one person meets those qualifications. On the other hand, if Congress puts in place a merit-based selection system and there are a range of candidates that would work and would qualify that the department head could pick from, maybe that would be okay. We can't tell you exactly how much discretion the department head would have to have. And so what the, what the, what the administration here did, um, and and I know there's different different viewpoints on it. In, in my in my view, based on what I have read, I, I think that it, it does actually quite a good job of of, of balancing the, the considerations. And I totally welcome pushback on that from Judge Gilbert and Judge and Judge Worth. But the executive order basically says. Um, we are going to take ALJs out of the competitive service system that they had been in with Office of Personnel Management because we have questions about that. However, the executive order does have language in it where it suggests that the administration still expects and wants ALJs to be hired in an objective manner. So it says they must display appropriate temperament, legal acumen, impartiality, sound judgment. If you go to the end of the um, executive order, it's it, it it essentially requires there to be regulations for ALJs that they be licensed attorneys. Now you'll notice when I'm going through these criteria that this is um, a lot more open ended than what Judge Worth was talking about. She was talking about many more specifics. What I think is happening with the executive order, I think that the um, I think that the administration still expects the ALJs are going to be higher based on objective criteria, but I think instead of having the centralized Office of Personnel Management, which has been coming up with criteria across agencies, I think the intention is to look more within the agency to determine what criteria it's going to look to. And, and one reason I say that is because um, just on August 30th, so this is very recent, within the last three weeks, the Department of Labor um, as an example, published in the Federal Register a notice of how it was going to move to administrative law judge selections. And again, Judge Worth and Judge Gilbert should tell me if I'm wrong here, but they, but what they do is they have quite a specific process that they go through where there's interviewing and they give criteria and there's evaluations and it's, it's very transparent and announced in here but it's all within the agency. So there's no longer any centralized Office of Personnel Management criteria. There's criteria that applies to the Department of Labor Administrative Law judges, and then there are gonna be interview panels within the department. And, um, and so it's quite specific. It says there's got to be a notice of vacancy posted in the Federal Register. The vacancy's gotta be held open for at least 30 days. So this is what you do if you wanna be an administrative law judge. Um, then what happens is you send your application to the Office of Executive Resources, and that executive Office of Executive Resources screens the applicants to make sure that they meet minimal qualifications. And some of the minimal qualifications are that you have to be, you have to have a JD from an accredited law school. You need to be licensed to practice under the laws of a state, District of Columbia. Puerto Rico or a territorial court. You have to have an active bar status and or membership in good standing for at least 10 years total in at least one jurisdiction where you're admitted. You have to have seven years of relevant litigation or administrative law experience, and you have to have knowledge of statutes enforced by the Department of Labor, and then it lists several of what those are. And then it also tells us a little bit about relevant litigation experience could be maybe preparing for formal hearings and trials, participating in settlement. So it lays all those out, and you've got to have your application go through that office 
use of executive resources to be qualified. And then if you meet that cut, then your application is sent to an interview panel that has the chief ALJ, the chief human capital officer, an assistant secretary, a member of a compensation appeals board. And, um, and what happens is that interview panel then is going to review and rank all of those qualified applications taking into account needs of the agency. And then the panel's going if to I can interview. Just, um, it, Professor Mascot, if I can just interrupt quickly, because I have a, I think this gets into a very important uh, area uh, of change that was the result of that Lucia decision in the executive order. And I just want to make sure that everybody's kind of catching the major change that occurred here. As Judge Worth uh, discussed earlier, um, the policy uh, for s uh, selection of ALJs uh, was handled by the Office of Personnel Management alone. They instituted a very extensive uh, process that I don't need to repeat here. Everybody heard uh, from Judge Worth, but it went, you know, ha having been through the process, having participated in the process, I can tell you it was the most extensive process I've ever uh, participated in or gone through um, to determine whether or not people uh, have the uh, ability and have the writing ability and have the uh, patience uh, to become administrative law judges. And the practical impact of the executive order uh, was to completely wipe that entire process off the board. In other words, it, it for something that worked for almost 70 years disappeared one day in July and entirely changed that. And I think that executive order as a uh, reaction to Lucia, a lot of people have felt was an overreach. It was a uh, far beyond what Lucia uh, necessitated or, or, or required. And I have a question here um, from, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but uh, Professor Jeffrey Lubbers, who uh, is a uh, friend of ours and a very good uh, uh, expert in administrative law. And uh, I'm just going to read Professor Lover's, Lover's question. He says, although the prior process for OPM rating of judge applicants was somewhat flawed, and I think everybody would probably agree with that, uh, it at least provided a minimum set of qualifications for lawyers who applied for the position, including having to be a lawyer for at least seven years. The president's executive order wipes all those aside, and now an agency can appoint any lawyer in good standing for the job. And notwithstanding what we just talked about with just the Department of Labor, because to my knowledge, no other department has established any sort of guidelines for the selection of ALJs. Uh, Professor Lubbers asks, doesn't that create a serious risk of cronyism and political, politicization of the ALJ core going forward? And I think that's a great question. And um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Professor Mascot, if you want to address that. No, I don't. I don't. I, I don't think so. I don't think that's where the administration's headed. And and the reason is because I think they were very made went to great lengths in the executive order to talk about impartiality and to talk about objectivity. And you know, having having thought through this a little bit and written a little bit about it at the at the at the, at the end of um, the Stanford Law Review study that I that I did on this, I I think where they're coming from is trying to. Um, is trying to make sure that the whole selection process is is accountable at the end of the day to the head of the department, but acknowledging that that process can still be objective and based on criteria. And so the reason I brought up the Department of Labor order in depth is, you know, as I said, it just came down August 30th. So I don't think we have any reason to assume one way or the other whether other agencies are going to do it. They may just be working out how they're going to implement the executive order. And um, the executive order suggests that it's now going to be up to the agency. So we might see it as more of the agencies being able to now come up with more individualized tailored criteria that they find important and in fact in one way the criteria the Department of Labor has is actually tougher because you have to be licensed for 10 years. I do understand I think you're exactly right it's obviously a dramatic change from the Office of Personnel Management but I don't think that the change is to politicize things I think it's to bring it within the agency. The only other thing I will I will clarify too is for listeners and for and for folks who may currently be adjudicators of course people who have already been hired the other thing is they are 
that's not in jeopardy. Every and you you all would agree with that, right? Like your appointments and your selection stays in place. Probably if you are looking to be transferred to another agency or a new appointment, that's when these new procedures come into effect. The one other thing I will say when I'd love, to, obviously another question or response or pushback is um, the executive order also made a reference to the removal of administrative law judges, but the but the, but but by statute, ALJs can be removed only for good causes established by the Merit System Protection Board. And so the executive order does not do anything to, um, to affect that. There is, um, then going to be a question though about what does good cause mean and so there's been some discussion as i understand it um, within the administration or with with litigants about um about what that means moving forward and i think the other concern i think that's been raised by some commentators that i've seen uh deals with the issue of uh, whether or not uh now that the agencies are largely uh in charge of selection uh, whether or not we're going to end up seeing a lot of agency attorneys become administrative law judges, people who are working for the agency already, have perhaps spent many, many years uh, prosecuting for the agency or defending the agency, are now going to be uh, the judges. And I think the concern there uh, from the commentators that I've been reading is that you're going to have a lot of pro-agency bias among judges who have spent their entire careers, in some cases, working for a federal agency who now become the, quote, independent adjudicator, uh, it's hard, I think, uh, for anyone to shake some biases. We all know that. And uh, when you're hiring only your own agency employees to become judges, it basically becomes a, uh, it's not an independent core of of judges who uh, who have no particular interest or allegiance to the agency, you now have an entire core of people coming on board who are wedded to the agency and the agency's mission. And doesn't that doesn't that potentially change the independence of the adjudicator under the Administrative Procedure Act? Well, well, it's certainly a, a good question and something to be on the lookout for, as you say. A absolutely, if you know, we would not want this 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 new core of administrative law judges to have one particular bias or just one particular expertise or be or be coming only from one particular source. Um, and so, you know, I don't know any more than you all do as, as to how this is being implemented within agencies right now. It does look to me like the interview panel that the Department of Labor at least has put together tries to counteract that by by including the chief ALJ on the panel who I would assume would be looking out for that kind of concern and then also making sure that the notice of vacancy is publicly advertised. But um, I, I, you know, of course that's a valid question to raise and would be something that, um, you know, would be something to be vetting for in the selection process is to make sure that there's not some one-sided or too much of a uniform um, you know, group of people who are being who are being picked, who would be only seeing seeing things from a pro-regulatory standpoint. Certainly. Very good. Do we? And and Judge Worth, feel free to jump in here. Do where do we see this going in terms of uh, how we move forward within the agencies? I mean, are we going to see? Uh, because I, I think the concern that some people have um, is anytime you make a change of this. Uh, this large uh, change, you know, what's the impact going to be on the litigants? What can they expect? Are they, are, are they going to see any difference? Um, most of the people are sitting there with, uh, uh, you know, with the Social Security cases. I think are a large, a large thing. Do we see any practical impact that uh, that litigants may may feel? I guess uh, Judge Worth will ask you first if you if you see anything. You know, I hesitate to speculate. That's just not in my uh, wheelhouse. I certainly hope not. And Professor Mascot, what about yourself? So I, it seems to me that the mechanism that the administration has in place right now is to try to start by making sure that that any ALJ who in the past was not selected by the agency head, that their appointment is ratified. So I think by doing that, the move seems to be to take the core of ALJs that are present currently and make sure that they have been um, given constitutional authority to preside over cases. And if that's the if that's the process, I think that'd be minimally disruptive. I mean, the counterpoint to what I'm saying is that within the SEC, what I have read is that the SEC, I think, ended up calculating that there might be a, a, as many as 200 proceedings that would be impacted by the fact that the ALJs had not had their appointments ratified earlier. So maybe people who had been 
had their case presided over by somebody who wasn't properly appointed in, in, in matters up to 200, if you include things that were open or the adjudication hadn't yet taken place, but maybe had started or there was still a possibility to appeal. So obviously that's a lot of cases, but, but it seemed to me from the order that I read that they had a very, um, specific process in place for moving forward and that they were going, they had ratified their ALJs and by a certain date, I want to say maybe September 21st, I'm hoping I'm remembering that right, that there had to be a sort of an agreement or decision in place with who was going to adjudicate over this process moving forward. And so they were going to try to make sure these cases were heard as quickly as possible. And of course, this wouldn't impact agencies at all where the um, ALJ ratifications ratifications of appointments that happened earlier, which as I understand is 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 quite a large group. So I, I think well, we this have, might have uh, less impact than we would have thought earlier. We do have over a million cases in backlog between uh, the Office of Medicare Appeals and uh, and Social Security. So uh, are we looking at the possibility that, that uh, some of these Social Security cases that have already been decided or in the pipeline have to be reheard? Or do we see anything, uh, you know, from a constitutional perspective in order to cure the unconstitutional appointment? Um, you know, do we do we think these cases uh, are, in, are we're going to end up having to rehear all of those cases? I can't say that I have researched the specific implications of the Social Security Administration, but if I had to look at the, it seems to me that there's an attempt within um, the various agencies to try to implement Lucia in as non-disruptive a, a way as possible and to, and to put some limitations on the class of cases that would have to be reheard. I think another limitation, uh, at least within some of the other agencies, is that the individual would have had to preserve the question of the constitutionality of the appointment. So you can't reopen cases or, 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 or let somebody now have a challenge to the constitutionality of the proceeding if that individual had never in any way raised the issue before. So how that's going to impact um, agency by agency, I have to admit, I don't, I, I have not looked at right now, but it, but it seems to me as though everybody's trying to work together to, um, to implement this in as expeditious of a way possible moving forward. Very good. I see it's uh, a little bit after two o'clock, so uh, I think we're uh, about ready to wrap up. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Judge Worth, uh, before we uh, close off? Uh, I just want to thank everyone for uh, attending and being interested. Administrative law is not uh, always the front page news item, but um, it is very important to the millions of individual litigants that appear before us on a daily basis. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen. And Professor Mascot, any last words? Thanks to both of you for all that you do and for inviting me to participate and for hosting this event and thanks to the um, to the section for hosting this and for taking an interest. It's it's uh, it's it's really um, it's really generous. Great. And I want to thank Judge Worth and Professor Mascot for taking the time today. This is a fairly complicated and complex matter to try to uh, fit into an hour discussion, and I think uh, they both did a great job of giving us a not only a broad overview of the situation, but also an opportunity to drill down into some of the issues uh, that this is going to uh, this is going to uh, have for us as we uh, as we move forward. Uh, stay tuned. This is all still uh, working itself out. Uh, there's a lot more litigation in the pipeline on ALJs, I'm sad to say. So uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be keeping our eyes and ears open. But thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, we appreciate uh, having you here, and thank you to the uh, Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice uh, for agreeing to host this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we're concluded. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Gilbert.